If anything has captured people's imaginations recently, it has been the idea that this planet has been visited by aliens. Probably one of the most famous stories in UFO history is that of evening of July 2nd, 1947. Apparently, an alien spacecraft is said to have crashed on the New Mexico desert near Roswell, Roswell, New Mexico. And of course, uh, a lot has been written about this story, as well as a lot of interesting cartoons. I came across this one talking about the uh, Ros Roswell Explained, saying, what was it holding? And it says, looks like a cell phone. So that's why there was an accident. And another cartoon, the pivotal moment at the Roswell crash site, when uh, the investigation shows that the uh, spaceship had a student driver. Well, apparently it's been claimed that civilians arriving at the scene witnessed the dead and injured alien bodies, and when the military arrived, they captured the craft and the aliens. And uh, you see here the Roswell Daily Record from that point in time, RRAF captures flying saucer on ranch in Roswell region. Um, I uh, came across an interesting article in The Sun, which uh, says a bizarre video shows alien carried away on a stretcher after Roswell UFO crash. And uh, this grainy video that you can actually see it online uh, shows something like this. And recently there is uh, emerged some film footage which purports to show that the military was dissecting two of the alien corpses back in 1947. I have to uh, admit that some people are a little bit skeptical about this film footage, but uh, um, that it, be that as it may. It's been claimed, however, that following this, the military then initiated a massive cover-up relating to this and a lot of other uh, apparent uh, UFO sightings. However, this past uh, couple of months, uh, we have seen that apparently the U.S. Pentagon has started taking UFOs seriously. And the New York Post here uh, talks about the fact that uh, the uh, Ex-Pentagon whistleblower here says the UFOs are re real and the Fed's cover-up is fueled by fear. And um, uh, it goes on to talk about the fact that UFOs may be a security risk and have no single ex explanation. Well, through the years, there have been numerous claims that people say they've been taken on board on these spacecrafts and have had operations performed on them. Uh, various articles and newspapers through the years and on TV, people being interviewed and telling how they were abducted by aliens. Even actress Fran Drescher says that aliens abducted her and implanted a chip into her hand. Um, I came across another interesting cartoon which says, um, uh, you can see here Rodney is being ushered off the spaceship and never mind, you can go. We don't want any of your DNA. See you by now. And at the bottom, it says Rodney couldn't decide if he should feel relieved or insulted. I like that. And of course, the World Weekly News, which carries all the, the you know, the truth as, as clear as, as a day, uh, asks questions about UFOs actually abdu abducting cows. Well, all of this interest in UFOs has spawned a whole industry full of movies and TV programs such as ones you see there uh, on the screen and uh, become a very popular thing. Well, today our text actually uses the word alien to describe, would you believe, us as Christians? And that's the word used in the New International Version in our text in uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11. Uh, Dear friends, I urge you 
as aliens and strangers in the world to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. And so this morning we're going to look at how this term affects the way we live our lives here on planet Earth. That we are aliens. That we are aliens on planet Earth. That's my message this morning. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to gather together again around the Word. And we thank you for the passage here in 1 Peter, which talks about how we are to relate to our world today and uh, uh, our attitude towards uh, life itself and seeing ourselves as aliens. I pray that you'll help me just to unpack this for the people. And this morning I stand against all the forces of darkness, command every evil spirit in the strong name of Jesus to go. Holy Spirit, I welcome you here. Guide and direct us into the truth that we need and help us to... Um, be drawn closer to you because of our time together in the precious and the wonderful name of our lord and savior jesus christ we pray amen when i was a little boy my father was an alcoholic i've shared my testimony of, of my experience growing up with him a picture here of him coming from his welding shop with a case of beer this was early one sunday morning and uh he you can tell already he's uh, looking uh under the influence already but uh, when I was about five years of age, my dad accepted Jesus as his personal savior. And in his life, from that point on until he died 50 years later, he never once again took a drink of alcohol. And I know because I watched him all through the years. I used to say, in our home, out went the bottle, and in came the Bible. And indeed, this is a picture of my dad now, a couple of years later, uh, reading the scriptures instead of drinking booze. And my father became what we today would call a total abstainer. We are a total abstainer. Well, the text tells us that we are to be abstainers as well. I urge you, Peter writes, as aliens and strangers in the world to abstain. Now, the word abstain in the Greek language, which is the original language of the New Testament, literally means to put a distance between and it tells us that we are to abstain from sinful desires and uh, that's what it goes on to say in our text abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul you see each of us as believers living in this sinful world will have an ongoing battle against sinful desires it'll happen uh, to all of us the um, constant uh, battle uh, to abstain from um, sinful desires. The word that's translated in the New International Version as sinful, there is the Greek word sarkikon, and it can also be translated as flesh or fleshly. And the word desires is the Greek word epithumian, which then me can also be translated as lusts. And the New American Standard Bible um, which is a very accurate translation of the original uh, Greek, puts it this way, Beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers to abstain from fleshly lusts which wage war against the soul. Well, when it talks about um, sinful, the Greek word sarkikon, sinful or fleshly, it's talking about our sinful fallen human nature that we all have inherited from our forefather Adam as a result of his sin in the Garden of Eden. And we therefore, because our forefather Adam uh, partook of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and that act led into sin, we therefore have inherited, each of us, a sinful human nature. That's why Paul writes in Romans 5.12, Therefore, as just as sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin, and in this way death came to all men, because all have sinned. And so when we talk about the flesh, uh, the, or this, that part of us, it's the capacity or the bent that we all have towards sinning. We just constantly are attracted to and drawn to sin. We chase after it, as a matter of fact. Paul writes of his own experience in Romans 7, 18, I know that nothing good lives in me that is in my sinful nature. Well, that's the word sarkikon sinful fleshly now the word that's translated as uh, desires or lust epithumian 
literally means to lust or to have a great desire for it. It actually can be a neutral term, either good or bad, depending on the object. For example, it can be good. It can be used in a good way. For example, when Jesus was having last supper with his disciples, Luke 22, 15 says that he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. And the word that the uh, English Bible translates it there, eagerly desired, is that word epithumian, same one, lust. I have eagerly desired. So it can be a, uh, used in a positive sense, uh, simply to desire. When I'm in a desert, I eagerly desire, I lust after water. Uh, or, as I said, it can be bad. And as a man, I can... Uh, I need to be careful, Jesus said, that anyone who looks on a woman lustfully, and that word there is that word epithumian. Now, these desires of our sinful human nature will work on us as we try uh, uh, and to try to get us to satisfy them. You know, the reality is that sinful desires don't go away when we get saved. As a matter of fact, they're very much alive in the heart of a Christian. It can feel like a battle. It, 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 the phrase there, it says, to wage war against the soul. It's the intensity and force of a war, seemingly, in our lives. So well, what's the purpose of a war? Well, the purpose of a war is to conquer, to subjugate and destroy, to take control. And your fleshly desires, my fleshly desires, will come relentlessly, time after time, to shackle us and to destroy our testimony as Christians. This is war. It's a military campaign, not just one battle. It's constant warfare. It doesn't get easier with age or greater commitment to Christ. If anything, it gets harder, more difficult. Um, Paul wrote of his experience in Romans 7, I know that nothing good lives in me that is in my sinful nature, for I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out, for what I do is not the good I want to do. No, the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin living in me that does it. And so what Paul's experience here is what he was talking about, this battle that he was going through. And indeed, the world that we live in makes it even more difficult. It's the world we live in is a spiritually hostile environment. And because of that, there will be constant attacks on our spiritual goals and our purity. And um, uh, the Bible talks about the devil. Our enemy prowls like a roaring lion looking for someone uh, to devour. Now, there are three, at least three areas where we battle these fleshly lusts that I want to look at this morning. First of all, there's in the uh, whole area of possessions, the desire to have, the de desire to purchase. Our sinful human nature will always be affected by greed and the constant desire for more. Luke uh, 12, 15, watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed, Jesus said. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. Some time ago, I was reading about how Eskimos capture wolves. The first thing what the Eskimos will do is they will uh, take a knife blade and they will cover it with animal blood and let it freeze. Then he'll layer another, uh, put another layer of blood and another until the blade itself is completely concealed by frozen blood. And then he puts that blood covered knife into the snow, sticks it up like this with the blade up and he waits for the wolf to come along. When the wolf comes along with his sensitive nose, he smells the source of the sin, and when he discovers that bait, he begins to lick it. And he's tasting the fresh frozen blood. And then he begins to lick faster and faster, more and more vigorously. He's lapping on the blade until that keen edge of that blade is bare. And now he's feverish and he's harder and harder licking the blade there in the Arctic night. And so great becomes his craving for blood that uh, he does not notice the razor sharp sting of the naked blade on his own tongue. And nor does he recognize the instant which, when, in which his insatiable at thirst is satisfied by his own warm blood. While his carnivorous appetite just 
craves more and more until the dawn finds him dead in the snow. Well, the second area are our appetites, the desires to consume. The another, this area of fleshly lust is that we constantly battle is our physical appetites, food, drink, controlled substances, etc. Uh, it's a constant battle in, in each of these areas. Reynold III was a 14th century duke living in what is now Belgium. And he was grossly overweight, and he was commonly called by his Latin nickname Crassus, which means fat. Well, his brother, uh, younger brother Edward, had a violent quarrel with Reynold, and he led a successful revolt against Reynold. And Edward captured Reynold, but didn't kill him. Instead, what he did, he put him in and built a room all around him in Newark Castle, and uh, he said to him that he would be able to regain his title and property as soon as he was able to leave the room. Now, this was not difficult, uh, wouldn't have been difficult for most people, uh, because the room had several windows and a door of near normal size, and none was locked or barred. Um, and um, he uh, sat in that room, and the problem was Reynolds' size. In order to regain his freedom, Reynold needed to lose weight. But Edward knew his older brother, he knew him real well, and each day he would send Reynold his food, a variety of delicious foods. And instead of dieting his way out of prison, Reynold grew fatter and fatter. Well, when Duke Edward was accused of cruelty, he had a ready answer. He said, my brother's not a prisoner. He may leave whenever he so he wills. But the reality was that Reynold lacked the self-control, the willpower that was needed to say no to those delicious treats in order to accomplish a greater goal, his freedom. He became a prisoner of his own appetites. Now that's why the Bible tells us, Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12, I will not be mastered by anything. He says in uh, 1 Corinthians 9, 27, but I discipline my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified. That's the second one. The third one is peer pressure, the desire to belong. And we all battle the desire for acceptance and to fit in. Back in the year 2006, I was the pastor at New Life Church in Stonewall, Manitoba. And the drama team from the youth um, uh, ministry there put on a dinner theater. It was called Luigi's. And they served a meal and then they performed a, um, a drama afterwards. Very, very well done. And after it was all over, the kids were cleaning up. And I was uh, hanging around there. And two of the young fellows came up and held, uh, they were taking the jugs of iced tea that had been left over on the tables. And uh, someone took a picture of them standing on each side of me. Um, uh, here you can see. Uh, and they were drinking. This is iced tea, folks. They're drinking iced tea here. And as I'm standing there, I'm thinking, man, that reminds me of my teenage years when I'd watch the other guys at school drinking beer. And I remember thinking as a teenager, if I want to fit in, I better start drinking myself. The desire for acceptance and to fit in. It is a powerful, powerful thing uh, in our lives. In his book, Hide or Seek, Dr. James Dobson uh, tells about a study done by a sociologist by the name of Ruth Brenda. And uh, they brought in 10 teenagers into a room and told them they were going to study their perception. That is how well they could see. And so to test their ability, they planned to hold up uh, three cards on which lines were drawn. And the lines were uh, of varying length uh, and were marked A, B, and C. And you can see there uh, the first card, the second card, uh, a different length uh, for each of the three lines as well as for the third car card. And so uh, the cards were then to be held up before the class and the researcher would then point to A, B, or C consecutively. And he asked the students to raise their hands 
uh, when the, the pointer was directed at the longest line. And uh, so that's what they did. Um, however, uh, what one student didn't know was that the other nine had been brought in earlier and had been told, I want you to vote for the second longest line. And the purpose of this, of course, was to test the effect of group pressure, peer pressure, on that lonely individual. Well, they said the experiment began with nine teenagers voting for the wrong line. And they said the stooge, the person who was set up, would typically glance around, frown in confusion, and slip his hand up with the group. The instructions were repeated and the next card was raised. And time after time, the self-conscious stooge would sit there saying a short line is longer than a long line simply because he lacked the courage to challenge the group. And uh, they said that uh, this remarkable conformity uh, occurred in about 75% of the cases and was true of both small children and high school students. And Brenda concluded, some people had rather be president than right. Well, this desire for acceptance can lead us into all sorts of wrong. Exodus 23 verse two gives a very interesting command. It says, do not follow a crowd in wrongdoing. What it's talking about here is mob mentality. And uh, we see this idea, the influence of the larger group on, on people in the trial of Jesus. In Luke 23, we read that wanting to release Jesus, Pilate appealed to them, to the Jewish leadership, um, but they kept shouting, crucify him, crucify him. And then Pilate said, why? What crime has this man committed? I have found in him no grounds for the death penalty. Therefore, I will have him punished and release him. But they came on even stronger with crucify him, crucify him. And the text goes on to say, but with loud voices, they insistently demanded he be crucified and their shouts prevailed. Now, there was a whole group of people there just beside the Jewish leadership, and no doubt there were some who were there just perhaps out of curiosity with no particular animosity against Jesus, but they would have gotten swept up and carried away by the emotion of the moment, the influence of the group. Instead of standing up, they went along. That's why Jesus talked about our eternal destiny. When he said, Matthew chapter 7, verse 13, enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction and many enter through it. The sad reality is most people are not going to heaven. Most people are heading to hell. And then he went on to say in verse uh, 14, but small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life and only a few find it. And that's the sad reality of uh, the tendency to be influenced by peer pressure. So we are not to allow any of these things to control our lives. Paul writes in Romans 8, 5, those who live according to the sinful nature have their mind set on that, what that nature desires, but those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their mind set on what the Spirit desires. And uh, so, so we should do it. Uh, sadly, so many people live under the captivity, the bondage of their own lack of self-control. Paul wrote about both People in the book of Philippians, chapter first, three, uh, 3, verse 19, their destiny is destruction, their God is their stomach, and their glory is in their shame, and their mind is on earthly things. It can be whatever, uh, I have illustrated food bondage here, but there's many other different things. New Living Translation phrases that uh, they are headed for destruction, their God is their appetite, they brag about same shameful things, and they think only about life here on earth. And you see this inability to control one's lust leads ultimately to one's own self-destruction. Well, in Reynolds' case, um, he ended up living 10 years in that room and he wasn't released until after his brother died in battle. But they said that by that time, his health was so ruined by his obesity and excessive eating that he too died within a year. Prisoner of his own appetite. What a sad story in the inability to control fleshly lust. But here's my second point. We can abstain when we see ourselves as foreigners. And while we cannot refuse to be tempted, we can refuse to yield. We can say no. 
Again, that text I read it a little earlier on, those who live according to the sinful nature have their mind set on what the nature desires, but those, what that nature desires, but those who live in accordance with the spirit have their mind set on what the spirit desires. Now, I know we all know that we should resist temptation to sin, but the question is how? And one of the concepts that uh, this passage here is teaching us is that when we accept Jesus Christ as personal savior, we transfer our citizenship from earth to heaven. Uh, my father moved to Ukraine. Actually, he was just uh, three years old when his family immigrated in 1914 from Ukraine to Canada. And he ended up actually becoming a citizen of uh, Canada. I remember seeing his uh, citizenship papers. Uh, back in the day, they used to call it uh, naturalization. Well, in the same way, we become citizens of heaven after we are saved. We have a new citizenship. As a matter of fact, that was true for my dad. Sure, after he got saved, he became a citizen of heaven. Philippians 3.10, but our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so as a result, our relationship to this world forever changes. We now see ourselves as foreigners and aliens here. Um, and we see that we're just passing through. Psalm 119, 19, the psalmist says, I'm but a foreigner here on earth. And our view of earth is that it's a temporary transitional place on our way to a permanent eternal home. Back when I was in Bible college, I sang in a quartet. We used to call ourselves the Volunteers Quartet. And one of the songs we used to sing, actually the one that uh, the Asador family sang for us at the beginning of the service. This world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. Well, that was a song that communicates this concept. That's why I chose it to start the service off with this morning. And that is why Peter addresses the believers he was writing to. He says, dear friends, I urge you as aliens and strangers in the world. And what he was saying is that since our citizenship is in heaven, we're actually foreigners here on earth. We're just passing through, just visiting here, our brief stay here on earth. As a matter of fact, this was uh, also Moses' view. It says, by faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to be mistreated along with the people of God, rather to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a short time. He re regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater re uh, value than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking ahead to his reward. He looked beyond what was here and now to eternity and what was to happen there. And so this mindset of seeing ourselves as simply being foreigners, pilgrims, aliens, exiles, all of these uh, synonyms describing the mindset we have to the world in which we live is how we should govern our lives. And when we do, we are able to defeat the fleshly lusts that wage war against our soul. The epistle to Diognetes was uh, written uh, in the second century AD. And in it, uh, it offers a self portrait of the early Christian community at that time. Let me read you a quote from that uh, epistle. For Christians are distinguished from the rest of men, neither by country, nor by language, nor by customs. For nowhere do they dwell in cities of their own. They do not use any strange form of speech. What he's saying here is Christians just live amongst everybody else. They, in the same town, same, uh, they live the, uh, wear the same kind of clothes. Uh, they, don't, they don't speak a different language. They all are part of the regular culture. But while they do dwell in both Greek and barbarian cities, each as his lot was cast and follow the customs of the land and dress and food and other matters of living, notice this, they show forth the remarkable and admittedly strange order of their own citizenship. They live in fatherlands of their own, but as aliens. They share their things as citizens and suffer all things as strangers. Every foreign land is their fatherland, and every fatherland a foreign land. They pass their days on earth, but they have their citizenship in heaven. You see, those early Christians had the correct mindset of life here on earth. They saw, we're just temporary here, we're moving on. It, we're, we're only here for a short period of time. Back in the year 2005, I took a missions trip to Mali, West Africa. 
And you can see me here with uh, one of the pastors of the churches there in Mali. Uh, and uh, they had uh, this uh, shirt uh, that they had made for me as a thank you for my ministry there. And uh, I have, over the years, traveled a lot over the world. I'm thankful for God's providing this for me. But this trip to Mali was probably my greatest experience of cross-cultural life. Uh, prior to that, most of my other trips were to first and second world countries, Israel, France, England, Italy, Greece, Turkey, Ukraine. But this was a third world country. Um, they, apparently this phrase now is supposed to be majority world, but whatever. And it was totally different from anything I had ever experienced before. Now, a lot of times when you go into another culture, it causes uh, various levels of stress and discomfort. Uh, as they actually say that when you're in a new culture, you're out of your comfort zone uh, because the people there do things differently than you're used to. Uh, and some call this culture shock. Um, and certainly more than once when I was uh, there in Mali, I felt that way. Um, I remember uh, seeing, uh, actually I took this picture, uh, the missionary was driving the vehicle and I took this picture from the front seat of the car of a woman on a motorcycle, you can see her right ahead of us, with a baby attached to her back. I couldn't believe it. And then uh, another experience there, frequently I would see uh, young women and young girls like these uh, that I'd come across uh, here, uh, spitting on the street. I mean, I'd never seen a, a, a young woman ever, in my lifetime, ever spit. But probably my greatest experience was that of the supper that I had at the home of Joseph. You see me here with him back in 2006. Uh, he was the director of the Bible school in uh, Bugini there in Mali. And uh, so I had supper that evening and they served the food in huge pots. And what you were to do was you were to reach in with your fingers. And uh, so that's what I did. I took some and then I ate it. And I remember thinking as I was eating, boy, this is not the way I'm used to eating at all. I don't, um, if I ever used my fingers, my mom would slap me on my hand. But I felt this unique feeling because I was a foreigner in Mali. I didn't belong there. I wasn't used to their culture and their customs. My home is Canada. Well, in the same way, because we are aliens, strangers, foreigners, pilgrims, exiles, we look at this world in, uh, and we look at this world in this way, it means two things. First of all, we live our lives differently than unbelievers do. As a matter of fact, it's not like when in Rome do as the Romans. That's not how we look at our lives, but rather we live our lives uh, insulated from the world round about us. As Paul puts in 1 Thessalonians 4, it is God's will that you should be sanctified that you should avoid sexual immorality, that each of you should learn to control his own body in a way that is holy and honorable. And notice the last phrase, which I have italicized, and not in passionate lust, like the heathen who do not know God. And they live with lives full of lust, hate, greed, anger, on and on and on and on. The life I live, which God approves, is that life of uniqueness in the midst of the larger culture. You see, when we say no to our sinful desire, we say no to our sinful desires. We don't live our lives where we do give in to ungodliness and worldly passions. Uh, Paul writes in Timothy 2, For the grace of God that brings, us, uh, brings salvation has appeared to all men, and it teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. Romans chapter 13, 12 and through 14. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave decently as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. Rather, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the sinful nature. That's what we're told. Don't think about how to gratify the sinful nature. And then secondly, we think differently about death than do unbelievers. Psalm 23, I love verse 4. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. And because we see ourselves just passing through, earth is just a temporary time 
to a real destination. As a matter of fact, this was Paul's attitude when he spent his last days in a Roman prison awaiting execution. In Philippians 1, he wrote it this way, For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I'm going to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I do not know. I'm torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far, but is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. And that's the wonderful reality of how we look at our lives, how we see them here on earth. Uh, our real home is heaven. We are just aliens on planet earth. I want to conclude with a story I came across some time ago. One day a spaceship landed in the middle of a huge field just outside a small rural community. The aliens looked friendly enough, so some farmers cautiously approached them, hoping to establish a good relationship with them. The aliens greeted the earthlings warmly and said, we are on a mission from the planet Zuron of the galaxy Andromeda. We have been assigned to explore your planet and discover what you've learned. We are here to learn as much as we can about planet Earth. So tell us, has anything significant he happened here on Earth that you can tell us about? Well, the farmers thought for a moment and one spoke up and said, we have radio and TV. We can send radio and microwave signals all over the planet using satellites. Oh, the aliens replied, we have that had that for thousands of years. In fact, that technology has become quite obsolete. What else has happened? Well, the farmers scratched their heads and one said, we've developed computers that can process information in seconds. It used to take years. And these computers are small enough to be carried in a briefcase. Oh, that's old news too, said the aliens. Hasn't anything extraordinary happened here? The farmers were still thinking when one of the aliens asked, we heard a rumor that God visited your planet many years ago. Is this rumor true? Well, there was a man named Jesus Christ, one of the farmers said. He claimed, yes, that's it, Jesus Christ. Did he really come? The aliens asked excitedly. Yes, said the farmer, but, but what an extraordinary thing. What a wonderful thing, exclaimed the aliens. Tell us, what did you do when God visited your planet? Did you bring gifts and throw them at his feet? Did you run the streets celebrating and singing? Did the world finally realize how much he loves him? Please tell us, what did you do? And the farmers pondered for a moment and then sheepishly replied, um, we killed him. Well, that's a sad story. They put Jesus to death, but there's good in that as well. Because of his death, we can have eternal life. And our lives here are just temporary. They're passing. Um, our real home now is heaven. And so we live here on earth as aliens. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it teaches us how to respond to the world in which we live and help us to abstain from fleshly lusts that wage war against our souls and to live lives that bring glory and honor to you. Pray for every person who's listened to this message this morning, that their spirits would have been touched and that they would make the commitment and surrender to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And this morning, as you're considering this, I would like to urge you, if you've never yet accepted Jesus Christ as Savior, why don't you do it today? Why don't you open the door of your heart? Like that cute little story about the aliens said um, about Jesus coming in. And he came to this world. He came, died for your sins, gave his life so that you could be forgiven. Just simply come to him in prayer and say, Dear Lord, I admit I'm a sinner. I believe you died on the cross for my sins. I ask you to come into my heart, forgive my sins, and become my Savior. If you pray that prayer and sincerely mean it, Jesus will come in. God bless you as you make that decision. Lord, bless every person who has heard what has been said and encourage them and strengthen them to follow through. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you for joining us today. We trust that what has been shared would have ministered to you and to your needs. Our benediction today is our text from 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11. Dear friends, I urge you as aliens and strangers in the world to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. Thanks for watching. God bless you. Have a great day.